again to the Explaining History podcast and today we're going to go back into looking at the origins of fascism. Now, if you want to start from the start with this, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, I did um, the origins of fascism part one and we're looking at the works of uh, Roger Eatwell on fascism. Um, Roger Eatwell is still writing at the moment, has written some very important works recently about the uh, global trend towards far-right populism, as we can see in um, uh, Trump and um, other unpleasant phenomena around the world. So, um, yes, check out his work. It's, it's well worth um, uh, examining. Now, previously, when we talked about the development of uh, fascism, we talked about its, its kind of historical antecedent and sort of um, collaborative ideology, nationalism. Now, nationalism as an ideology is a, a problematic concept because there are all manner of different nationalisms. There are liberal nationalisms, conservative nationalisms, and racist uh, nationalisms. If you go back to look at the 1848 revolutions across Europe, these are largely liberal um, uh, revolutions. Um, the uh, meeting of liberalism and nationalism was that liberals um, that wanted uh, the establishment of um, uh, democratic rules of uh, constitutional rules of law uh, that were not decided by uh, monarchist autocracies believed that the nation state was the vessel which would contain these uh, progressive developments that if a German or an Italian nation state was founded then it could be founded as it was being founded a constitution could be written that would enshrine the rights of citizens uh, as a result so this was um, a, a a notion of uh, nationalism as a kind of a, a tool, a Trojan horse for progressive values, and that the the nation as a kind of a neutral entity could be whatever um, people wanted it to be, or whatever uh, liberal revolutionaries wanted it uh, to be. As a result, conservatives like uh, Bismarck were highly sceptical of nationalism. They saw it as a highly dubious thing. And Bismarck in the 1860s has his conversion to nationalism where well, he suddenly realises that it can be captured for conservative ends, for keeping the Prussian aristocracy at the top and the, um, uh, the, 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 the poor uh, where they belong, the, uh, the, the, the rising or working classes uh, and the, um, uh, the, the German, German peasantry. And the fact that there was the beginnings of an industrial revolution uh, and the development of a uh, proletariat in Germany um, and people such as in 1847 Karl Marx writing the, the, the Communist Manifesto saying, well, revolution, this, the spectre of revolution is haunting Europe. People, um, the you know various kind of conservative ideologues said, yeah, this Marx guy's got a point. We need something that will capture um, the plebeian um, and that will capture the working classes and um, nationalism, patriotism, belief in the nation, belief in identity behind the flag, and behind the glory of one's own imagined past. This is how you do it. And this is how nationalism shifts in the 19th century towards the right. And this is an important part of the development of fascism. So Roger Eatwell writes... The holistic nationalism, this holistic nationalism, I beg your pardon, was highly critical of liberal universalism, a future which contributed to the rise of a new racism. Hostility to outsiders has existed since prehistoric times, and ancient Greek philosophy had demonised the barbarian other. What emerged during the late 19th century was a more developed, systematic form of racial thinking. Two names stand out in this development. The French aristocrat Arthur de Gobineau and the Englishman Houston Stuart Chamberlain, who in later life adopted German citizenship and became an admirer of a rising young politician named Adolf Hitler. Gobineau's key work was his essay on the inequality of the human races, written in the 1850s, but little read until the 1870s. He saw the world as polarised between white, yellow and black races, Caucasian, Mongoloid, Negroid, and argued that the motor of history was the struggle between these races. 
Chamberlain was deeply influenced by the nationalism of the composer Richard Wagner, who became his father-in-law. His Foundations of the 19th Century, published in 1900, was widely read, or more precisely, sold and talked about. Its seminal importance to the emergence of fascism, however, lies in more than its influence. It is also related to its style. The Chamberlain's arguments were not simply based on Wagnerian historical or mystical notions. He synthesised these ideas in, with a growing body of scientific and intellectual developments and rejected the pessimism of Gobineau. So, here we have the meetings of extreme romanticised nationalism and um, racial thinking, or for want of a better word, racial science. Now, without getting into um, a, a discussion, a complex discussion about what a science is, one can certainly argue that um, eugenics and racial so-called science isn't scientific at all. Um, science is a peer-reviewed system of knowledge that requires um, or relies upon hypothesis, uh, testing and repeatable results. There's essentially none of that in uh, racial thinking. Uh, racial thinking starts with um, the prejudicial assumption. And racial thinking um, works in the opposite of a, a sort of like a, a refined, uh, a, a defined system of knowledge. Racial thinking starts with the prejudice and then selects the evidence to support it, editing out anything which uh, challenges uh, the belief. So taxonomies of race based on uh, intelligence or physical strength are, of course, uh, as, as any rational person knows, um, uh, largely meaningless. And those like Gobineau or Chamberlain or later Hitler who um, are advocated them um, had basically no scientific base upon which to work. Uh, and so it, it, we, one cannot call racial thinking scientific. There are uh, racial arguments, flawed and uh, essentially based in bigotry and prejudice, uh, certainly, just because, there are, uh, just because they are, are, are weak or uh, flawed arguments doesn't mean to say that there are those that don't consider them arguments at all, um, but they are not based in any kind of, of meaningful science. Now, the interesting thing for our purposes, when we're looking at the, uh, the works of Gobineau and Chamberlain, is that they, are, they, they lay down the kind of many of the, the, the founding ideas are uh, later on Nazism that uh, specifically racialized variant of European fascism. Hitler in Mein Kampf has virtually no uh, new ideas. Every idea from the notion of the leader, um, the, the Fuhrer figure, all the way through to there being a, a racial hierarchy, all the way through to the idea that Gobineau put forward, that the primary driver in history was racial struggle. The, um, these, these were not original ideas by Hitler. Hitler um, is often thought of being, by his admirers or his detractors, an original thinker. He's certainly not. His entire repertoire of fascist ideas are cherry-picked from uh, racist thinkers in the mid-19th century. So in this period, of the, sort of the mid-century, we have this um, kind of intersection between a radical romantic nationalism and racial thinking. And of course, it is um, the discoveries of Charles Darwin, which are um, used and abused by racial thinkers, um, that uh, adds kind of um, a great deal of energy to these sorts of discourses. Roger Ewell writes, Arguably the most important 19th century scientific development in its impact on political ideology was Darwinism. Charles Darwin published The Origin of the Species in 1859, Others quickly realised that some of the key ideas, especially survival of the fittest and natural selection, could be adapted for political ends, though there were disagreements over what their implications were. In one version, Darwinism seemed to point to the need for minimal state intervention to allow free competition. In another, Darwinism was taken as highlighting the need for the state to take on the role of selection 
to ensure the survival, especially in the battle with less developed but, uh, but virile martial races. So here you have um, the seeds of um, Darwinism within classical economic liberal thought, the idea that um, uh, individuals, businesses um, are uh, actors within uh, an economy and need to be left to either thrive or fail. And those that fail uh, essentially uh, are editing themselves out of economic activity and this is an entirely good thing and that uh, state assistance simply encourages the weaklings to thrive uh, and creates a sluggish economy. This kind of uh, economic liberalism of the 19th century uh, re-emerges uh, in Britain and America and then in, across the rest of the world from the 1970s onwards in the guise of, of neoliberalism or monetarism as it was understood then. The uh, other perspective is the idea that the state should intervene in order to ensure that um, some kind of um, racial or genetic selection happens. Now, even in um, supposedly liberal states like uh, Britain and France, um, eugenics movements uh, emerged in the 19th century uh, and in the 20th century, particularly after the First World War, some of the, the kind of the, the greatest intellectual luminaries of the age, from the Huxleys uh, through to the uh, um, uh, sexual health campaigner Marie Stopes uh, in Britain, uh, were advocates of uh, a kind of like a class based eugenics, uh, encouraging. Um, working class people to have fewer children um, because they had uh, they, they posed the uh, the threat in the eyes of um, uh, of um, the the Bloomsbury types uh, and Fabians um, that they would they would outbreed the bourgeoisie. Um, there's a very uh, detailed argument of this in uh, Richard Overy's The Morbid Age, which is always always well worth reading. Always advocate that book on on this podcast. Um, and so eugenics, uh, particularly, was not seen as really, you know, a dirty word until uh, after the discoveries of the death camps uh, in uh, Nazi Nazi Germany and occupied Europe after the Second World War. It seemed perfectly natural that the state should have a role in improving. Um, not just the not just in in marginalizing uh, racial minorities, but in improving the stock of the the kind of the racial majority overall, uh, encouraging uh, those with better genes to breed and those who were uh, inferior to have fewer or hopefully no children. Statist racism, as you can call eugenics, uh, was pioneered by uh, leading scientists throughout Europe. Um, in the 19th century, one being the, the German scientist Ernst Haeckel. Um, the eugenicists were uh, worried about the way that moral laws uh, prevented the workings of natural selection. So um, their uh, view, which I think was perhaps uh, shaped in, in, in some part uh, by uh, Nietzschean ideas, was that Christianity itself had caused societies to become sluggish, societies to um, become uh, over, overtly kind of sentimental and protective towards weaker genes, and that um, human morality was at odds with the, the demands of nature and the workings of nature, um, and that um, there needed now to be... Um, a regeneration or a rejuvenation of um, national or even European racial stock. When, if you imagine the worldview of the bourgeois eugenicist of the 19th century, not only looking at um, inferior peoples, in inverted commas, within Europe's uh, empires in Africa and Asia, and seeing um, birth rates uh, far higher, uh, and worrying whether white Europeans and their white European civilization might be eventually be outbred, but also looking at the uh, environment around them in the, the the heart of Europe's industrial revolution, looking at the um, 
the numerous but often uh, sickly and underfed and seemingly degenerate, there's this, this term that keeps coming up time and time in racial thinking throughout the 19th century, degenerate, um, degenerate working classes of the European cities, um, it was, uh, and uh, infused with the, the kind of, I suppose, the arrogance of colonialism uh, and the uh, ideology of class. It is quite easy to see how they came to the conclusion that only uh, um, that, that removing impediments to natural selection was the logical way to go. However, statist racism goes one step further and it places the eugenicist as the selector. And finally, when you reach um, the kind of the, the uh, height of this creed in uh, the T4 action programme in Nazi Germany, the doctor becomes the uh, figure who has responsibility for uh, not treating the um, uh, treating the the, in, the individual patient. Uh, the Hippocratic Oath demands that one does no harm. Um, German um, SS doctors viewed their role in the T4 program as treating the racial body. Germany itself was the patient and that it needed to and the racial body itself needed to be improved and the interventions needed to be made principally mass murder in the T4 action. Another intellectual trend of the late 19th century which became another um, core component of fascist thought was the idea of elite theory. So by 1914 across Europe and largely independent of one another um, sociologists, uh, particularly the Italian sociologist Vilfredo Perito uh, and the German sociologist, sociologist to pardon, Robert Michels, um, who had become um, an Italian citizen, um, believed that societies necessarily had to have elites and they needed to be ruled by them. And societies without elites did not function. And the, uh, this notion becomes a kind of an article of faith in fascist thought um, as the, the idea of the leader, um, of the uh, charismatic leader, who, could, who is the only individual capable of making sense of an increasingly complex world, um, emerges. Um, the argument was that major differences uh, between the forms of governments were simply the social composition of elites, and the extent to which they were open to talent from rising social groups. But that the core similarity was that they were all uh, run by elites, by and large. You had more, uh, more uh, autocratic societies, such as Russia, which were entirely exclusionary of any kind of social mobility, or you had more meritocratic, more uh, open societies such as Britain, where it was possible for there to be a degree of social mobility for uh, non-aristocrats to wind up as, say, for example, Prime Minister, to take for an obvious example of David Lloyd George. However, uh, the idea that societies can function without elites and they could function without elite leadership was considered an anathema to the entire school of thought. Um, the next development that shaped um, fascist thinking uh, comes from psychology. The main intellectual figure here being Sigmund Freud, who uh, had argued um, in his uh, works that a, an unconscious mind, unconscious drives uh, exist. And this pointed towards the belief that human beings were fundamentally irrational. This undermined the Enlightenment idea that human beings were rational actors, particularly when it came to voting and elections and could make uh, conscious and sensible choices um, and uh, decisions about the kind of government that they should have. A significant contributor to um, the argument of the irrational human was Gustave Le Bon, who wrote in 1895 The Psychology of Crowds. 
um, and this depicted human beings as an emotive mass. Firstly, that needed to be controlled, but in as far as uh, fascist thinking went, that could be manipulated. Um, the idea of the kind of the, the, the mass psychology of fascism, that is, um, if you look at um, the rather crazy writings of Wilhelm Reich, and then the, the more um, rational uh, writings of Eric Fromm in his book The Fear of Freedom, published in 1940. These both take psychoanalytical approaches to understanding uh, what motivated individuals to support Nazism. Uh, and there are various theories, some less well, less well kind of received now than others, uh, about the kind of the power of the unconscious mind and unconscious emotional and psychosexual drives that were uh, forcing people into the arms of Hitler. Now, in the next podcast on this uh, topic, we're going to look at two further philosophers, Friedrich Nietzsche and Georges Sorel, um, who both had key contributions to the development of fascism. What I'd like to stress here is that unless you're talking about people like Houston Stewart Chamberlain and Arthur Gobineau, very few of the intellectuals we've talked about here advocated anything like fascism. Um, Obviously, um, the likes of Charles Darwin, their work has been um, the foundation of all modern life sciences. And there's very little in Darwin um, that you could argue is is in any way applicable to uh, fascist ideas. But that doesn't stop um, people um, from uh, Chamberlain onwards, and Gobineau and Chamberlain uh, onwards, uh, all the way through to Hitler, cherry-picking aspects of what is being argued uh, to support uh, an, an ideological position. Um, that's not really the fault of, of the science, it's really uh, the way in which human beings uh, use uh, supposedly categorical, rational, scientific truths to uh, promote kind of ideological positions. Uh, you can see not just in fascist thought, but in uh, various different kind of ideological approaches um, from Marxist-Leninism to neoliberalism throughout the 20th century, um, the idea that they are ultimately grounded in scientific understandings of the world, um, the uh, economic models created to predict human behaviour uh, and to uh, optimise uh, economic benefit for human beings uh, purport to be scientific pictures of, of how humans uh, interact. And there's a, a whole field of uh, writing and thinking about this, uh, the kind of the, the rather chaotic and often bloody interactions uh, between uh, scientific arguments and scientific enlightenment rationalism uh, and um, extremist political creeds throughout the century. Uh, if you're interested in more in that, check out the videos of um, Adam Curtis, the documentaries of Adam Curtis, though, uh, particularly a uh, good source of um, a kind of uh, I- ideas on that. So we're going to continue with the development of fascism um, in a, in a, over the next few weeks. I hope you find this useful and interesting, and I'll catch you on the next Explaining History podcast. Thank you. All the best. Bye-bye.